What is up? Welcome to another fireside chat. Here with Chasing Billy, your host, Cardigan Kid, Cardi K, the rabble rousing, troublemaking host, always stirring the pot. Nasty dude is in the house because quoting sources is nasty. Hey, Joy, Sandra, or Sandra, I don't know the articulation on that. How's everybody doing tonight? <clears throat> Welcome to our weekly meeting, our weekly gathering of Billy fans, aficionados. Sandy, cool. All right. I'll remember that. I wonder if Misty's poured her wine yet and settled in by a nice English fire. Somebody needs to be by a fire for these fireside chats. <clears throat> I don't even know why I called them fireside chats. <clears throat> I guess I just like Roosevelt, maybe. I don't know. Um, so today, uh, our, our friend uh, Massimo, uh, I always feel like I butcher that name. But he's a great researcher, and he posted something in a comment on Facebook, and he uh, he mentioned something that I've also done some research on, and, and it's also my position, and it's something that I believe that Fred Nolan got incorrect in his um, West of Billy the Kid book and elsewhere, and that's concerning William Antrim. Uh, Billy the Kid's stepfather. He uh, he says that William Henry Harrison Antrim went to the Supreme Court and won a Supreme Court case for wrongful drafting in the Civil War, and um, that is also, I think, where they get the name William Henry Harrison Antrim. I've never seen any other documentation that says that his middle names were H H or Henry Harrison. Um, but this this William Henry Harrison Antrim, who went to the Supreme Court, was actually in Pennsylvania, and he was, I don't believe, our Antrim. I think that this was a guy who uh, was drafted. That would have been about 1863, and he sued for wrongful drafting. He went all the way up to the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania because he said he had a sick mother he had to take care of. And the same William H. H. Antrim is on the pension rolls as having been wounded. Uh, he had um, chronic diarrhea uh, as a result and a lot of other problems that William Antrim never reported. William Antrim was never in Pennsylvania. He was in the Indiana um, infantry, I believe, possibly. But he only served for like a few months at most and didn't see any action. I think he was stationed mainly in Indianapolis the whole time. So um, it's always been my contention that these two Antrims have been confused. So in Nolan's book where he says that, you know, William Antrim took a case to the Supreme Court and won, uh, I think that's the wrong William Antrim. And also when I say things like, you know, I think Antrim was in the infantry and he served for a few months. That's because on these fireside chats, that's exactly what these are, just hangouts. These are not academic reports or official research reveal videos. This is just me and you hanging out and chatting. And, you know, when we're all sitting around talking about Billy, you know, we're quoting sources and we're talking about things in books that we've read and we're going back and forth and it's, it's going to be a lot of like, well, I think it's here, or I think it was this amount of time, or in this census, but, um, you know, it, it's not an academic presentation, so I, I won't be coming at you with like prepared sources and things I want to talk about. It's kind of just like turn the camera on and and what's on your mind kind of thing. But um, I was glad that Massimo posted that because. That's always been a contention of mine that, that I haven't really addressed, but I also agree with him that this is the incorrect William H. Antrim. And that might be the only place we get the Henry Harrison part, that his name was William Henry Harrison Antrim. We, his middle name might be Howard. 
you know, I think it's plausible his middle name was Henry, William Henry Antrim, but I'm not sure we know that for sure. And if anyone else has any sources or anything where, you know, William Antrim is stated on record as HH or his full name is used, point that out <clears throat> and we'll do a follow-up on that. But that's just uh, one example of how no researcher, no historian, Fred Nolan is a giant upon whose shoulders we stand in all the Billy the Kid research uh, world. But even he was not omniscient. Uh, research is ever evolving, ever, you know, things are being discovered daily. Uh, anyone who says there's nothing new in the Billy the Kid world is just out of their mind because you learn something new every day and or you you know rediscover something new every day that someone may have discovered back in the 60s or something and kind of it's been overlooked or forgotten about um but you know nothing is sacred in billy academia nothing is like well nolan said it so it must be true or utley said it so it must be true the only person who has i think uh, doctrinal infallibility is uh, James B. Mills. We can't question Mills um, because, uh, I mean, Mills is just the man. So <laughs> I hope you're watching Mills. <laughs> uh, we are going to have James Mills on the show sometime. We're going to uh, talk about his book, Billy the Kid, uh, El Bandido Simpatico, and um, everything he's put into that and how long he's researched. And we're just going to riff about the kids. So that'll be fun. We've got some guests lined up. Um, we've got Jason who's going to come on soon and talk about his brushy timeline. And uh, we're always trying to pull folks in. Um, I'm in contact with a few others. Haven't been really nailed down yet, but the guests, it'll be fun. It'll be a good time. And I think that's probably one of the more enjoyable parts of doing this is getting to talk to people and getting others to hash their theories out with me and have a good time. I really enjoy editing the pre-recorded videos and allowing my humor to get in there because this feels just too fun and life is too fun to, to not come at it with a joke every now and then and, and enjoy it. You can't be too dry or, or dogmatic about this stuff. Um, Josh says David Turk wants to join us. I'd love to have David Turk on here. He's great. Uh, he's with the he's a historian for the U.S. Marshals, and he wrote a book on Blackwater Draw, uh, where Morton and Baker were killed. And uh, I believe he's written. Did he write Here Lies Billy the Kid or something about his grave? I think. And uh, he's just a nice dude. So yeah, we'd love to have him on. Um, really, we'd love to have anybody on. If any of you guys want to come on. That'd be awesome. I would love to have, I've tried to get Mel to come on, but she refuses. She flat out refuses to come on the show. Um, but that's cool. She designed our logo and she does a lot of behind the scenes work, like reminding me to do stuff that I forget. If anybody knows me uh, beyond just the acquaintance level, then you know that I am the most absent minded individual you will ever meet. I forget everything. And a lot of times that come across as offending people or making them angry, but it's just, it's not intentional. I just forget stuff. And I've told Mel, yeah, Mel says I nag, but I, I need the nag. I, I, it's like, I can't remember stuff. So somebody's got to stay on me. So I call Mel my uh, talent agent. She's my manager. Um, but yeah, get David on Josh. Let's set that up. That'd be fun. Uh, I'm looking forward to, Thursday the 9th, I believe, of November is when we're going to be recording a video with Jason, uh, and that will be an amazing episode of Chasing Brushy, and we're, it's going to just be a brushy extravaganza, so that'll be fun. Uh, again, I love talking about brushy, and I know I've gotten a lot of heat from people in the past who have been like, you know, you don't need to talk about brushy, and he's not part of the Billy the Kid world, he's been debunked and so on, but he, he clearly is still a very hot topic. So, and I'm fascinated by him, so I'll keep talking about him. Um, so 
uh, nasty dude. Nobody can manage me properly, but she's doing her best. Uh, Rollin is now nasty dude. You know, it's kind of like that scene from Young Guns 2 where uh, Billy looks at um, Henry and goes, you're Buckshot George. You know, that's your name, Buckshot George. I think that's what he called him. Uh, Rollin has been dubbed nasty dude. Uh, someone called him a nasty dude, I guess, in, in the comments for uh, being pestering about a source. You know, somebody makes a claim, they want to, you want a source. And I guess it just, that made Rollin a nasty dude, but that's now his outlaw name, Nasty Dude Rollin. Um, it's a, it's a good moment. It's, it's a, a, a milestone to earn your outlaw name. So congrats, Nasty Dude. That's a good, I, I guess I got mine, Cardi K. So, uh, you know, I could think of about 10 more that's probably more appropriate, but not repeatable in civilized company but <laughs> but oh this table it, it moves when i laugh yes it is a badge of honor but we uh we've got a lot planned for the show uh so i know one fellow commented on the facebook page and was like you know it's it's got to be more than you and josh all the time and, and you need more guests but uh number one uh what's that say about josh i mean i thought he was enough you're enough for me josh but uh, but yeah, we do have more guests planned and we, we want to cover everything writers. I think it'd be cool to get like, I would love to get Vincent D'Onofrio on the show at some point. Let's, let's shoot big. Right. And talk about the kid. That's a great movie. He uh, directed that. I would love to talk to all these, you know, actors and, and folks who've done, you know, let's talk to Tom Blythe. But the thing is, this is kind of like a, uh, off the cuff kind of show. And, we're not going to be prim and proper and, and abide by like these set talking points that producers have put together. So that might be kind of tough, but it would be really cool to get some folks on here to talk about Billy who have portrayed him or been in the entertainment industry and things like that. I don't know how much they charge for that or if they do, but that's something that's like a long-term goal of mine is to get some, some folks like that on. I'd love to talk to Ethan Hawke. He's like one of my favorite actors and he did a great Pat Garrett or Dane DeHaan. If you can't tell, I love the kid. It's a great movie and uh, you know, nothing will top young guns for me, but that's just nostalgia speaking. The kid is actually a really good film. So if you haven't seen that, I recommend that or, or old Henry. It'd be cool to talk to folks who were in that. What a great movie. Um, What's on your all's minds? What are you, uh, I know, I don't know if you're all researchers or if you spend 26 hours a day researching Billy like, like me and Josh do, but what's, if you've got any questions, if you've got any topics that's kind of burning a hole in your mind, uh, share it. Let's talk about it. Um, I have been again, just in the deep end on brushy stuff. And um, I hate to just always bring that stuff to the table because there's so much more valid things to talk about. But if you want to hear about brushy stuff, uh, we can always riff about brushy. Um, I'm rereading Pat Garrett's authentic life of Billy the Kid. And I kind of got an idea. I want to kind of get all of the older Billy the Kid narratives, <clears throat> sorry, like Garrett and let me get a drink of my strawberry lemonade. Check that out. It's beautiful. But I want to get all the narratives like Garrett and Seringo and Otero and, and line up their narratives kind of side by side, it, kind of like how they do the harmonies of the Gospels. They take Mark, Matthew, Luke and John and they kind of match up the sequencing. And I would love to do that with these early accounts just for reference and just so we can kind of see like which anecdote and which legend originated from which source. And that'd be kind of a cool put together. I'd love to publish something like that, but then you get into the issues of rights and all of that, but there might be a way to do it. Um, Roland says more valid than brushy, but nothing is more entertaining than brushy. No, that's true. Um, I don't know why he fascinates me. Um, I, I, for one thing, I love that time period. The, the, 
early 1900s up into like the 40s and it was a weird time for the wild west you you know there was a sense of showmanship you you had all the wild west shows all the um memoirs the really really exaggerated memoirs of folks like you know buffalo bill or um texas jack and ozark jack and al jennings and the the dalton gang was real big um and i just love that stuff and and it seems like every old man with a white beard claimed to have ridden with quantrell and um just this this swagger all these old timers had it's like nobody was checking their sources so they all claimed to be best friends with kit carson and and all this stuff and it's just a fascinating snake oil salesman era and uh i just really dig it so that's one thing that kind of keeps me in the brushy world um delavina's letters yeah uh james mills posted one of them uh in the life and legend group and it was very cool uh, i can't say i'm very familiar with all of them i know i've read them in sources and things like that but they haven't stuck with me um josh says we need to get cal poke's account and combine that yeah um cal poke you know roy young argues in his book and other folks have argued and i tend to agree that <clears throat> cal poke uh gives his account it's included in the book um what is that book called the capture of uh billy bonnie capture billy the kid I've, I've been saying chasing so much it's like is it called capturing billy the kid but Cal Polk's account is included in that. And he gives a, I mean, his account could be a movie. I would love to make a movie out of Cal Polk's account and kind of direct it like the Coen brothers do or something and uh, just have it be outrageous. Uh, but he says that he was there at stinking spring when they captured the boys and um, he gives just a very detailed account, but <laughs> everybody says he wasn't really there just trying, trying to cash in on the the fame of the storytelling. But he says that Billy gave him his rifle and, and everything. And then it turns out he wasn't even really there. He was one of the folks who kind of dipped out. Um, yeah, it's called The Capture of Billy the Kid. It's a really cool book. A lot of valuable firsthand accounts in there. That's also a book that includes Jim East's letter to Seringo, who says, we went over there in Delavina. Uh, came to get us to visit Paulita and he calls her in that. And, and here's an interesting thing. Jim East does not refer to Paulita by name. He calls her Dulcinea del Toboso, I believe. And that is what <clears throat> they name Billy's love interest in the show, the new MGM plus show, Billy, the kid, they Billy's love interest is named Dulcinea del Toboso. That name uh, it comes from Don Quixote's. Uh, yeah, that's the name of the book, isn't it, Don Quixote? <clears throat> it, there's a a literary device in that book that kind of evolved to mean someone's sweetheart. So when someone would say that's their Dulcinea, <clears throat> that's their sweetheart. And so when Jim East refers to Paulita, he says that's you know Billy's Dulcinea. Del Toboso. And I don't know if maybe Michael Hurst, the, the creator of that show, read that and thought it was a real person or if he intentionally just named, uh, you know, just created that character and just picked that name. But I always thought that was kind of funny that the thought that he he just got that wrong and thought it was a real person. But <clears throat> but yeah, that's something. I still do think that Paulita was his love interest and <clears throat> and I think that the the lengths that so many different people went through to not mention her name in the 20s and you know around that time is very intriguing like did she have uh some kind of agent who went around and told all these people don't mention my name did everybody know that Burns kind of avoided slander and everybody just kind of watched their step around it. I don't know. It's really odd. Henry Hoyt did the same thing. He 
called her the Lolita of Fort Sumner and wouldn't mention her name, but he does earlier uh, in articles and things like that. So, hey, Misty, I figured you were just, <clears throat> you know, making a wine run or something. <laughs> um, but that's a good book, Capture Billy the Kid. If you are looking for, you know, books to spend your money on for your personal library, that's one of them you want to get. And most of them, mine did, they come with this, like, insert map of Fort Sumner, Charlie Four's Fort Sumner map. And I've seen a lot of folks open that book, and it's this folded insert, and I've got it hanging on my wall now, so that's kind of a neat little addition um, that I didn't know about. Nice little surprise when you order a book and there's something like that in there, or it's signed. I've ordered tons of books off eBay for, like, three dollars and it's signed by the author and i thought that's pretty cool um another book that used to be maybe around 50 bucks at least was uh los belitos uh it was uh i forget his first name uh his last name was rudolph and it, it's by lewis branch a descendant and it's his story of his involvement in the capture of billy at stinking spring and it's just a neat little um, piece of history and now it's been republished by descendants of Lewis Branch and been made affordable once again and I think that's awesome I actually pinned a post about that in the group uh, another great old book to have I wish they would republish I Buried Billy so I wouldn't have to spend $90 on it or so uh, yeah Josh I would love to see all those early West books published Early West was like a uh, publisher that put out these great books. They also put out uh, Wilson and the Kid about Billy Wilson. And I don't necessarily agree with what it says, but it's a very interesting book. They contended that Billy Wilson was not the um, Anderson guy who died in Texas that Pat Garrett got a pardon for. They think it was some other guy. I think his name was Martin. Uh I'm not sure. It doesn't really add up for me, but it's another early West classic. Um, man, Josh has all the info. You need to be on the show too. Out of College Station, Texas. Um, Rollin says uh, Lucian Maxwell was a close friend of Kit Carson. And yeah, I don't doubt it. I've never read that. I haven't, I don't know much about Lucian Maxwell, but I believe that. And uh, William V. Morrison was a distant a uh, relative of the Maxwells. He was a, like, so many times great nephew or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you're not enough, according to some folks. Um, but like I said, you're enough for me. Um, but Roland is correct. Nothing's more entertaining than Brushy. Uh, his followers are are another thing, but, you know... It's almost to the point for me that uh, I'm just ready to disengage all those cats and not, you know, I've tried so long to dialogue with them and to have a conversation about history that involves sources and, um, you know, history, but it just never works. It always devolves into like just blatant insults and condescension and uh, just horrible stuff. And it's, it's vitriol, it's nastiness. And I, I can guarantee you on my part, I've never started out like that. I've never started with insults and the, the blame is always on us. Like uh, we start out that way and now I've, I've tried to have serious conversations about brushy and it just, it's impossible. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mel says it's because Josh doesn't wear a hat that he's not enough. He tried, but he, he just, he, he didn't stick with it. You got to keep it on. You got to keep the hat on. And, um, Josh says, hashtag release the tapes, Dan. Um, that's kind of, that's kind of a, uh, a campaign that we want to start guys because, uh, and, and I'm 100% serious about this. The only thing that we have from Brushy is basically the transcripts that you find in Alias Billy the Kid and other interviews 
And these are all filtered through the um, the writing and testimony of William V. Morrison. And one of the questions, one of the things that people debate is, was William V. Morrison in on it? Was he, was William Morrison a fraud? Was he, um, did he knowingly kind of prop up Brushy to tell the story or did Brushy con William Morrison? Did Morrison really believe it? So uh, one thing that I think would be really helpful that we all think would be helpful, and I know we'd love to hear it. We know that they recorded these interviews with Brushy. They, I, I assume, used an old reel-to-reel -reel or something like that. They sat down and, and Brushy told his tale on these tapes. There's even a book um, by W.C. Jameson. I think it's called like The Lost Interviews or something where he claims to have um, heard the tapes. Um, but the thing is, is, is nobody, these are not public. The tapes are not public. And we know that uh, Dan Edwards does have the tapes and it would be fantastic if those tapes were released. Um, what do we hear on the tapes? I, I want to hear Brushy's voice. I want to hear him tell the tale and I want to hear how easy it flows. Does Morrison prod him? Does Morrison suggest does he, uh, you know, kind of fill in blanks for Brushy? Or does Brushy have an extensive knowledge of the Lincoln County War and of, of the history? Does he talk about it as if he knows the things that no one else would know unless he was there? And I think that hearing the tapes would be the one thing that would either lend heavy credence to his claims or would all or would reveal you know the fraud behind it and uh if the tapes are in someone's possession and we do know they are then why have they not been released it's um a question i would love answered and so we're kind of doing this hashtag campaign i guess josh threw out <coughs> release the tapes dan hashtag release the tapes dan um I mean, heck, I'd pay for those. I'd, I'd pay to hear those um, because I love Brushy and I want to hear those tapes. And are, barring the fact that, you know, for some reason they're not listenable, I don't know why they haven't been released. Uh, the best anyone can say is, well, if you want to know what's on the tapes, go read W.C. Jameson's book or read alias Billy the Kid, but we don't know the tone that they were delivered in. We don't know if they're faithful transcriptions. You know, if you've got a, a party of folks, myself included, saying that Brushy was not truthful and that he was not Billy the Kid, you would think you would have these tapes that would have him convincingly talking about all these things and really selling it that you would release them. So, uh, Josh said that the coalition will pay to have them restored if money's the problem. Absolutely. Um, I know that it is possible, you know, if tape is torn or, or, you know, damaged, it can be repaired it's spliced back together, things like that. So uh, that's something that we want to do. And I'm not being snarky. I'm not um, trying to start anything. I just really want to hear the tapes and, it's been brought to my knowledge that those tapes are in the possession of someone who can release them. Um, so let's let's move forward with that. Uh, Ted Le, Ted Lapari Lapari. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Ted. He says, Cardi, do you still guest appear on Mag's podcast? No, no, I don't. Um, I'm no longer affiliated with Michael, and uh, wish him the best. Uh, it appears he doesn't do the all things Billy podcast right now. Uh, he mainly focuses on his books and his writing. Um, but I, I did enjoy when I was on it, but I am no longer associated with Michael and no longer care to be. So, um, we just do our thing here at chasing Billy. Uh, 
James, you are right about some of the brushy people, says Rollin. I've encountered on YouTube those that post in comments. It's fun for a while to engage, but it always ends the same. Yeah. Well, that's the temptation, isn't it? Hey, man. Uh, that's the temptation, isn't it? You, uh, you get bored and you're like, I'm going to go have a dialogue on Facebook, you know, and, and it just, it degrades so fast. Um, <laughs> that's right, Rollin. It is such good sport, but you do expect them to offer evidence. And it's so weird. They'll, they'll say something like, like this one guy said, I, I asked for evidence and he said, Billy Barlow's grave is 11 feet, uh, South or whatever of where Billy, the kid's headstone is. And then later when I asked for evidence, he was like, uh, I told you Billy Barlow's buried so-and-so. And I was like, that's not a, that's not evidence. That's not a source. That's the good night, Josh. Go do your entry level stuff. <laughs> I got to stop that. But um, the problem with the brushy narrative is it is all science, all history, any claim that that's true or that's good, whether true or not, is, is falsifiable. If you say, um, I uh, went to work today. Uh, you can check at work and see if I really did or not. If you any claim that you make can be falsified, can be tested, and every brushy claim is not falsifiable. You cannot say, "Well, brushy wasn't here at this time," because they'll just say, "Oh, well, he it was a different name." You can't say, "Well, brushy doesn't show up on this roster that he said he was on." Well he was using a different name. Brushy wasn't on the Texas Rangers. Well, he was using a different name. Brushy was really Ollie Roberts. Well, uh, he assumed the identity of his cousin and his parents totally mistook a distant relative for their own son. Well, his family said, some of his family said he wasn't Brushy. Well, they were covering for him. Every objection you bring to Brushy is not in their narrative. Uh, there's just a loophole around it. So you can't disprove it because they squirm to another scenario and, and it deviates from what Brushy said himself. They're able, you, so you can't even take Brushy's words and test them and say, no, it, it didn't happen that way because they'll say, well, obviously Brushy was an outlaw on the run and he was lying. And so not even Brushy's claims can be tested because obviously he's an outlaw and he was lying. So we have to find out the truth. Morrison even says this in a footnote in alias Billy, the kid, he's like, we had to construct the narrative and we had to, uh, again, the book's not in front of me, but I'm going to give you the gist of it. And we had to construct the narrative and there's many times that he dodged this answer or clammed up at this answer. And we had to put it together. And it's like, Okay, if he says I was at this, you know, event in Wyoming in 1889 and this happened and then you look up and, and see that it, there was no event in 1889 in Wyoming. Oh, well, that's he was really there at this time and this happened this way. And of course, he was trying to cover his tracks and nothing is ever disprovable with a brushy claim. And I think that's one of the big problems of the narrative is that, you know, if I believe something, for instance, uh, the wild West historical association is coming out with an article that says, uh, I, I don't think it's been released yet, but they're coming out with an article that says, um, that, Crap. Oh, yeah. Uh, Charlie Beaudry. You guys ever just talk and you're in the middle of something and your brain just stops working and you're like, what What the hell am I talking about? It happens to me a lot. It's probably related to my absent-mindedness. Um, but anyway, Wild West Historical Association is coming out with a article about Charlie Beaudry's wife, Manuela. And apparently they're asserting that uh, Charlie's wife was not Manuela Herrera the sister of Doc Skurlock's wife, so that 
Charlie and Doc were not brother-in-laws um, or brothers-in-law. So that's a big, I mean, that was a big assumption throughout Billy history. And it's still a big assumption. And it's, it's kind of an assumption I still lean towards. So I, th I think that they were sisters that Doc and Charlie married sisters from the Herrera family. And it, it just seems like if that were not the case, it would have been corrected sooner. Uh, I, I think even like, you know, I've, I've read blood in the saddle a little bit. I haven't finished it yet, but it's about Doc Skurlock. And I think the family Bible they say in that book even says that they were sisters. But here's the thing about falsifiability. If that article comes out with hard evidence and, and really convincing uh, arguments that that is not the case, then we change our narrative and we say, okay, they weren't brothers-in-law. They, they didn't marry sisters. That's the thing about history. That's the thing about making a falsifiable claim, a, a claim that can be tested. You can change your narrative and historians do. Um, but the thing I've encountered with brushy folks is that just it, it, every objection, every time a claim doesn't lead anywhere, every time a claim is shown to be not true, it's just turned around and, oh, well, that's because he was an outlaw or that's because he, uh, he was squirming around that question and didn't want to get in trouble. So it, to me, that's the biggest problem I have with the brushy community is they have no falsifiable claims. You can give a source for why you think a certain way and they will just cuss you out and provide no sources of their own. Um, and, and man, it just, it makes you very tired. Um, now let me get caught up. I was going on a rant here and um, Laura Flanagan. Welcome Laura. Uh, in regards to brushy bill, go to the Heiko Texas museum and there are papers on display of Morrison's. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'd like to go to Heiko and visit the museum. Um, I have a ton of uh, papers to go through. The University of Texas at El Paso sent me a ton of papers from the Sonicson and the Leon Metz collections uh, of Morrison's letters uh, between Morrison and those folks and clippings. And um, Morrison would carbon copy folks in his letters so it was kind of like a facebook of the 50s so morrison would would get mad for instance uh edwin curl coral it's a weird last name put out a book called billy the kid and it was a novel it was a fiction novel called billy the kid and uh morrison fired off letters to the publisher and to edwin the author himself and just these huge letters about you know how he's not historical and, and his, he wants the definition of the word novel or uh, novel and history and, and all these definitions of words, because the way that Edwin's using them is not correct. And uh, he wrote to the publisher and he wrote to magazines that advertised Edwin's books. And he wrote to read, you know, a, a guy that sold the book and tried to convince them all it's not history and they're, they're liars. And Edwin, the writer of the book, and he wrote back to Morrison, a short letter. And he was like, Morrison, it, it's a novel. Like I, I have nothing else to say. It's a, it's a novel. It's a fiction novel. And, and Morrison just wouldn't have it. But anyway, he would CC these people. And, and so at the bottom of the letter, it would say carbon copy CC. So he would send it to Sonicson. He would send it to Carl Brahan to uh, um, some of them to Maurice Fulton. I mean, like he had this circle of people that he would send them to kind of just uh, ostensibly for the records. But I feel like there was a bit of a ha, Look what I look what I just showed up with uh, this guy. Look at uh, look how I uh, burned this guy. Um, and I guess that's kind of what you did before Facebook. Uh, you just CC'd folks and, and sent them copies of the letters. Um, so, but yeah, yeah, I'd like to see what papers they have at the Heiko Museum. Um, 
Uh, I'm missing messages here. Uh, I hope one day that you, Josh, and Dan can come together. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Uh, he's welcome to come on the show. Again, I don't... Uh, this isn't like a beef that I, I'm going to keep going. Um, again, I there are times we're going to talk about Brushy just because Brushy is a big part of Billy to me. But um, I don't... Uh, I don't intentionally keep this beef going. Um, he's welcome to come on the show uh, and we can do a live or we can do a pre-recorded show. I don't know that he would want to. Um, and that would be up to him. And he would probably accuse me of like wanting to use his, uh, like in his first comment, he would want, he said something about me wanting to use his name for, attention or something and ended it with weird, but no, that's not it. I just got mad that he was talking about my friends. Um, so if, if he's able to, uh, not discuss that aspect of it and just discuss brushy, sure. I don't, I don't care to have him on. He, Mel is 100% right. Dan is welcome to come on the show. Uh, but I agree with Mel. It's unlikely he would. Um, I missed what alias sombrero Jack said. That message was retracted. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and, uh, it, it's just, I, I don't, you know, I run off at my, I, I run my mouth a lot and it's something I have to watch, but I try to be civil and never heated about it. And, uh, I try to always say things that I will stand behind, um, regardless of, whether I turn out to be wrong or not. So I try to, if I put a comment out or if I do a live video or if I do a pre-recorded video, I am ideally, and I think I, I adhere to the standard that I've given myself. I, I stand by it and there's no need to go back and retcon. There's need to go, no need to go back to comments and delete and to, uh, um, you know, remove comments. And so like we had a whole thread, uh, Dan posted a comment and, uh, said that we deleted insults and that, you know, he said I should take the video down. And I, I wrote a long response saying why I would not, <clears throat> why I would not take the video down. And <clears throat> I can't find that now. I don't know if he's deleted that. <clears throat> and today, I'm sorry about the coughing. <clears throat> Maybe it's this dry climate. Today, um, I my 11-year-old, <clears throat> I have four kids, my 11-year-old asked me what was going on in Billy the Kid World, and I told her there was a little bit of drama because I had to make a video and, and uh, address someone who was uh, slinging in you know, derogatory or defaming statements of my friends and things like that, and I was going to let her hear the initial... Um, part of the video that caused me to do a response and it was on Dan's uh, death of Billy, the kid volume two. So I went to it at the 42 minute mark to let her hear it. And it wasn't there. And so it, it appears that that's been edited out. So that whole segment uh, where Dan was talking about <clears throat> an anonymous podcast that sells shit on websites and, spams facebook groups that whole segment is out <clears throat> he did <clears throat> i'm sorry he did the same thing with um there was an earlier video that where he was talking about steve cedarwall um threatening his family and uh that that was a 15 minute video and he was disparaging michael uh judas sissy for his he was saying he was a terrible filmmaker and stuff like that and uh, yeah misty Bring me the whiskey. But, you know, he was saying these horrible things and then it was like 15 minutes long. And then when you go back now, the video is like three minutes. Um, I never want to do that. I never want to be the kind of person who says things and then has to go back and remove comments or to uh, re-edit videos because I said something that for whatever reason it's been removed. I don't know if he doesn't want people to hear it or if, you know, I'm not sure why, but I've learned that, you know, in the internet world, anything that you want to address or to uh, respond to, you better screen grab it because this stuff will disappear. 
And I always want to be the person who, if I say something, I put it on record and there it is. Um, <clears throat> Roland just said, I just got notice of another Rushy poster leaving me a condescending comment on a different channel. They never stop, but you can't beat the timing. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, Laura Flanagan, I've, I've been meaning to look into St. Louis or um, Morrison was a member of the Missouri Historical Society. And did he do you know if he left a lot of his papers uh, to them? Uh, I'd like to search through their theirs as well. Um, the I know he did a lot of Maxwell contributions also and <clears throat> i figured those would be somewhere um i think even i i have a paper that that says uh that that kind of has a blurb about the <clears throat> maxwell papers being left in springfield um yeah i i i'm trying to read as much as i can on the whole brushy thing uh <clears throat> there's a ton laura uh at the University of Texas, El Paso. Uh, if you just email them and request uh, the Leon Metz. I, what I did was I requested all the brushy related materials from the Leon Metz papers and the Sonicson papers. And I mean, it's a ton to, to f sort through. Very interesting, very fun to, to look through. Um, there's a poem in there that uh, apparently Brushy Bill wrote. Uh, kind of neat. So I thought we could share that sometime, a little poem of Brushy Bills. Um, but yeah, and there's the contract <clears throat> that, that Sonics and Morrison drew up for Alias Billy the Kid. Neat stuff. It's cool stuff to, to look at. Um, so yeah, I would suggest if you haven't checked out the El Paso papers that there's a lot of stuff there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, it's quite costly. They charge... Uh, per page. <clears throat> so <laughs> um, make sure you have your credit card handy. I didn't really know that until after I knew they charged, but like I didn't get the invoice cost until after they sent it all. And uh, it was like, Oh man. So I should have waited till payday. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would love to have folks who uh, believe the brushy side on the show. I'm not opposed to it at all. It's just a matter of like, can you keep it civil and can you go five minutes without like cussing out someone or using a, you know, cheesy accent to condescend to your opponent or whatever, whatever you want to call it. I don't even look at them like opponents. I mean, if you're looking to get at the real history, <clears throat> you shouldn't be worried about being disproven because if you're disproven, that just means you're that much closer to finding out the truth. So I don't even see people that disagree as opponents in history, but you know, to the way they talk about, you know, folks in a condescending tone and, and anytime, uh, uh, you know, you try to paraphrase their, um, their arguments, the other side's argument, it's in this condescending voice. And I just can't stand that. Um, <clears throat> what's going on in the chat here? Yeah. Yeah. Misty, and, and that's, I don't want it to be a Jerry Springer episode, and that's the problem. Um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> no, it is not 40 or $50. I think my total invoice, Laura, was like $240, if I'm remembering right. So, yeah, my kids aren't having Christmas this year. <laughs> <clears throat> but, I mean, you, you ask about, uh, you know, folks will say, I can't believe that you uh, you sell stuff or that you, you know, that you post uh, a link. And like I have a link in every video that's like, <clears throat> sorry, guys, buy Cardi K a cup of coffee or something. But it's like, man, anything helps towards that, because like all the research you do eventually costs money. And uh, that that 250 bucks came out of my pocket and uh, I sent. Uh, maybe like 45 or 50 to another library for some other non brushy related materials. And, um, but it, I mean, it, it's worth it. I mean, it, you can't find everything on the internet and, um, gosh, if I were richer, I would take, uh, plane trips all over the country to visit these collections and go through every piece of paper there is in every collection. Um, you don't know what's lurking out there in the dusty, 
tomes of these, you know, back rooms in these libraries. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, Rollin says we ought to be able to have an adult conversation. I've never had contact with Dan or Brett, but they're followers only. It's never pretty. No, it's not pretty. And I've never had contact. Well, I spoke with Dan on messenger once about an issue, um, uh, that brushy related. So, I mean, it was polite and everything, but like he didn't, give any credence to the possibility that it might have been legit the point i was making he just immediately was like that source i can guarantee it's a fabrication or something like that um i can post the screenshots um but again it was like he'd never heard of it before but he knew within five seconds oh, that's a forgery <clears throat> or that's a fabrication it's like why don't you consider this could be you know there could be something worth investigating here um Misty says it's hard to have a battle of wits with an unarmed opponent. Well, I think a lot of them, a lot of brushy folks have wits, uh, and, and they, they have the wit enough to sling an insult every now and then. And I'm not saying folks on the Sumner side don't sling insults either. It gets heated on both sides, but the goal should be to have civil conversations about getting to the truth. And uh, it shouldn't be that hard. And there's a lot of just other baggage that gets brought in. Like, I don't like my friends being accused of stuff that there's no proof for. And if there is proof, then you take it up with the authorities and you don't talk about it on public videos. And you obviously know you don't because you go back and remove them from your public videos. So, like, I just, I don't get that kind of stuff, man. And it really makes me mad. But, um... I try to remain civil about history and you just can't seem to win. Like no matter how civil or clear you try to be in your communication or how articulate you're always the villain who is part of some, it's, it's almost like they, I feel sometimes like, do people think I wake up in the morning and say like, how am I going to protect the name and reputation of Pat Garrett today? Like, how, who do I have to lie to and mis misrepresent history to to make sure Pat uh, keeps his glory? Like, I don't, who thinks that? Like, who, who thinks that I wake up and say, like, how do I keep Brushy from being identified as the real Billy? Like, do I get a check from some, you know, shadow organization that pays me to spread lies about history? It doesn't make sense. It's almost like schizophrenic. No. If I found documentation or a picture of Brushy that was like with the regulators or something that was undeniable, heck, I'd be on board. It's history. It's true. But it, I just don't see it, and I never have seen it. I saw it the first 30 days or so that I got into Billy because I was fired up. I got every Brushy book. I was like, yes, this is a cool story. And then I was like, oh, uh, none of the records kind of support it. Nothing supports it. So I left it, but it, if something came out or if I found, you know, I haven't exhausted all brushy sources. I haven't read all the Morrison papers. I haven't heard the brushy tapes. It, maybe there's something there. I don't know. I'm not opposed to changing my mind, but these things, you know, these historical battles are fought like crusades. Sometimes it's like, this is not a religion. This is not something that is already set in stone. I'm not arguing the truth of the Bible here. I'm not defending something that can't be changed. Um, I'm just saying, here's what I think based on the research I've done and what folks who I believe have credibility have said. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, but I, one thing is, you know, as I'm looking into the coroner's report argument, you know, Morrison said, there's no legal proof Billy died because there's no coroner's report and he was never paid the reward or that kind of thing. And I know in these off the cuff conversations, I'll be accused of misrepresenting or, or uh, you know, lying or getting it wrong. And it may be so, but it's not done out of malice. It's just because I can't remember and I don't have the sources with me, but it, it seems to me that this issue was solved in Brushy's day. I mean, it, it, Morrison seemed to really take modern legal requirements and apply them to 
1880s uh, American frontier territory uh, when uh, things were very mismanaged, disorganized, and uh, just almost ready to burn down any minute. And so to say like there's no official coroner's report filed at this and this time and these T's and I's aren't dotted and crossed and it's like this is 1881, 1882 in the New Mexico Territory, you know, you're, we're lucky we have anything. And, but anyway, uh, I mean, there is a coroner's report. I'm, it, it, there's a, you know, the whole idea that the photostatic copy is a forgery. Um, it, again, that's the, that's the falsifiable thing because um, I believe it was Maurice Fulton who found the coroner's report and he had a photostatic copy made and he, he told Morrison and he told folks in newspapers that you can tell this is an original because the signatures are all different. If it were a reproduced or copied one, then it would be the same handwriting and it would say signed because that's how you transcribed a, a report like that. But you can see the signatures are legit. They're different. They're made by different people. And brushy folks will say that is proof that uh, it's forged. See, because Fulton would know that the signatures would all have to be different. And that goes back to that non-falsifiability. Like, okay, we found the coroner's report. Oh, well, that's a forgery because obviously it's too real. And it's like, what do you, what do you want? You know? And the fact that Garrett was never paid the reward, I'm pretty sure he was uh, in the appendix to alias Billy the Kid, the 1955 Morrison book. They include the act of legislature that uh, grants Garrett the reward money. And they literally say in the legislative act, this is the reward money. Pat was paid the reward money. And Governor Rich's reason for not doing it uh, at the time and waiting for the legislature to do it was he specifically said, so I don't get burned for misappropriation of funds because it was not filed with the attorney general. And Wallace did issue a reward. He did sign off on it. There, He did have a document, but for whatever reason, it wasn't filed with the attorney general at the time. So Rich said, uh, yeah, Pat killed Billy. He deserves the reward. But if I pay him now, without it having been registered at the attorney general's office, then someone might come and accuse me of misappropriation of funds. And I don't want to do that. So the legislature can do it here in a little bit. And I'm sure they will because he deserves it. And when legislator legislature did, they said, yeah, here's your reward. It, there is nothing in there about, Oh, well, I don't want to do this because we all know he didn't kill Billy and there's no legal proof. It's like, all that is that whole motivation is fabricated. And then to say like the Santa Fe ring. Uh, so the Santa Fe ring, you're telling me that they hire Pat Garrett to kill Billy. And then he goes and doesn't kill Billy. And they somehow want him to still get paid for it. Even the, but somehow don't want to put the death, have a legal record of death on it. It's like this secret shadowy witchcraft laden group is inconsistently motivated to help Pat Garrett for not doing something that he, they hired him to do. I just can't keep up with the logical circles you got to run in. And it's six fifty eight, guys. I'm sorry. This turned into a brushy, uh, fest. Uh, it's just something that is just like been on my mind for days. And, uh, my interest in it <laughs> having, uh, made the whole, uh, address video I did this week um, just kind of like re-sparked my interest in the brushy story. And it's, it's really all I've been reading up on. Um, but I hope I made sense. I hope some of my ramblings made sense. Uh, it's probably a little unfortunate that these off the cuff fireside chats can sometimes just lead to me rambling. Um, uh, Misty says, Cardi K, have you read Hell Dorado, Bringing the Law to the Mesquite by William Breckenridge? No, I haven't. Thank you, Misty, for giving me another thing to spend money on. I always love to add to my list of 
you know, things I'm spending money on that aren't necessities of life. <laughs> as long as I have candlelight to read books by, I don't have to pay the electric bill. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a fun time for me. I hope it's fun for you. Again, I'm sorry I went on a rant um, today. Uh, and next time, uh, you know, one thing we could do is if there's anything you want to discuss or talk about, uh, you could always just email me beforehand and um, I'll, I'll make a list of things you want to talk about. Uh, James dot Townsend at BTK coalition dot com. And um, I'll just compile a list of things you want to talk about. Misty says, I'll lend you my copy when I come over. That's nice. But, you know, Mel uh, got one over on you. She mailed me a book the other day. Um, and then she knows that I'm so absent minded. I won't mail it back. She said she'll get it back from me when she comes over. So anyways, it's seven o'clock. I have fireside chatted y'all up uh, till you've probably fallen asleep. So I appreciate you hanging out um, next week. I can't guarantee it, but it will be my goal to talk more about Billy and not about Brushy because I don't believe they were the same person, but um, we will get back on track and begin chasing Billy again. <laughs> so uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for your input. Thanks for being here. And uh, I hope I made sense. I'm going to go ahead and hit this uh, end stream button and see what happens. What happens if I press the red button? I don't know. <laughs>